just a few years ago, some of us in this group here were worshiping the Lord in Israel. It was a great experience to be there and to worship the Lord. It was, it was something that we will never, never forget. You guys have been there as well, yeah. Quite a few in the audience here has been there. We're going to give you several things today. Won't you uh, give them this first, these two things first, and then we're going to give, I'll explain what they're getting on the. We've got a lot of handouts to give you that you will take home today. But it is great to be in the house of the Lord and to be together in the Lord's place today. To worship Him and give Him honor and give Him glory that is due. And I appreciate Ed and the worship team as they lead us, lead us to a place of giving honor and praise to our God. They do a great, a great job doing that, and we appreciate them so much. We started a series three weeks ago. This will be the third week on giving thanks, thanksgiving as an expression of our hearts. And let me recap a little bit as he's giving out the notes for today. And I'll explain some other notes we're going to give you in just a few moments. We started out three weeks ago talking about the necessity of Thanksgiving out there in the foyer. Uh, we have the messages on a board there. You can pick one up from weeks ago. We talked about Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else. As you're the greatest treasure that you have. For out of it flows the issues and actions of life. We talked about Thanksgiving being an expression of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or one translation put, puts it this way. What fills the heart rises to the lips. I love that. Heartfelt thanks should become addictive. We should become addictive to gratitude. We should become addictive, addicted to praise. Amen. It just comes out of our mouth. It is the abundance of our heart that flows from our lips. Heartfelt thanks should be an attitude of thoughtfulness. Heartfelt thanks should become a part of our true worship. If you're going to worship God in spirit and truth of John 4, 24, gratitude is a part of that, right? Uh, our expression of our heart of gratitude should be an act of faith. Our blessings of the past came from God. Our present blessings have come from God. And future blessings by faith is an act of faith as we give our gratitude and praise to God. Our thanks and gratitude should be an expression of love. A expression of faith, an expression of true worship. It should become an attitude of thoughtfulness and it should become addictive of giving thanks and gratitude and praise to our God. Last week we talked about great promises of a faithful God. God's lordship is much greater than your hardships. God is great and God is good. Listen. George Mueller said many times when I could have gone insane from worry it was I was at peace because of the truth of God's promises I love that and last week believe it or not we talked about 39 books of the Old Testament which are we found 39 promises and 39 reasons to give thanks unto God Every word God speaks in the Bible is directly or indirectly a promise. For it gives us his thoughts, his mind, his intentions, his faithfulness to our needy hearts. How many needy people do we have here today? I think we're all in need of the Lord and his blessings. Now, what I want to give you now from last week as if Barb didn't have anything to do. 
except run the universe and run this church here. She has she has printed off all the scriptures that we dealt with last week. So you'll have that to, as a companion to the notes. So, uh, Mr. Jerry, if you would give these out. These scripture verses for last week of the 39 books of the Bible uh, promises. And then he's going to also give you the 27 books of the New Testament and the scriptures we're going to be dealing with today. So you're going to have a handful of things to work with. But you'll be blessed by them. And we're so grateful for for Barb putting her time in to do that, to make it so good for everyone here today and be a blessing to you. Yes. You know, evil doesn't take a holiday, does it? And we need to be in prayer for those in Wisconsin that uh, so many were injured and some that perished in the parade there because of evil that was unloosed in that uh, place there. And I just think about how blessed we are today to be in God's house, to be here in, in our right mind and to be here with our bodies sometimes a little bit old and sometimes a little bit decrepit, but we're here because of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. But let's pray for those families in Wisconsin that are that are grieving today on this Thanksgiving weekend for what they've had to go through. Let's remember them in our prayers. Today we want to talk about the great promises of a faithful God. This will be number two of this series. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 The one who called you is faithful. And he will do it. The one who called you, he's faithful. He will do it. He will bring things to pass in our lives. Father, we're so grateful and we're filled with gratitude today for your blessings to us. We pray that you'll bless everyone today that have come to hear the word of the Lord, that have come to lift up their voices and their hearts of honor and praise to you today. Speak to us afresh and anew through your Holy Spirit and through the everlasting unbroken promises of your word. We thank you today and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God guides us like a shepherd. He counsels us like a parent. He protects us like a mighty army. I mean, knows the army of heaven is a mighty army, huh? And he enriches us like a king. Don't you like that? God guides us like a shepherd. Like a shepherd lead us, O oh God. He counsels us like a parent. He says, now, let's talk a little bit. I think we need to have a little chat. How many knows that God sits down and through his word and he speaks to us all the time? Someone said it this way. God can speak audibly. He speaks sometimes in our spirit. He speaks through dreams and visions. He speaks through people. But he always speaks through his word. Amen. Always. He, he guides us like a shepherd. He counsels us like a parent. I mean, he's had to counsel your children along the way. I mean, those that no matter how old they get, they still need counsel, right? He protects us like a like an, a great army, armies of heaven. He enriches us like a king. How many feel like you've been enriched today by our Lord? Joseph Rainsford, an Irish pastor in the 1800s, a short time ago. Every biblical promise, he says, is guaranteed by the cross. 
and secured by the yes and amen of risen Jesus. The steadfastness of God's promises is built on four pillars. God's holiness will not allow him to deceive. God's goodness will not allow him to forget. God's truth will not allow him to change. God's power will not allow him to fail. The promises of God are built on these four pillars. Don't you like that? And this was said in the 1800s. One thing I love about the hymns of Christmas, there are, some of them were written in the 1700s, in the 1800s. Think about it. For all these hundreds of years, people have gathered and sing of the greatness of our God and of our Messiah Jesus for hundreds of years. And they wrote these songs and they still are sung today, even though they were written so many hundreds of years ago. That just thrills my soul. And I know that the commercialization of Christmas is a pretty amazing thing, how, how we commercialize it. But think about a positive thing. If you're walking in the mall and they're playing hymns of who Christ is, it is the gospel going forth. And the greatest theology that you can ever find, you'll find in the great hymns of the 17 and 1800s. But in the 1800s, Joseph Rainsford said these four pillars, God's holiness, God's truth, God's goodness, and God's power, the promises of God are built upon that. The presence of God's righteousness and mercy, which were from everlasting and formed the covenant with us. I'm really glad God's made a covenant with us is the unchanging foundation upon which his promises are built. God does not change. Can I hear an amen? amen? Nor does the glories of his person and the salvation he engineered for us. The bottom line is this. God's promises are as dependable as he is. God's promises are as dependable as he is. And I like this. And I said, Joan, let's bold this real big there. Make it bold. Satan has no answer to God's nonstop faithfulness. He don't have an answer for it. Nope. The faithfulness of our God. Now, as we did last week... Let's go through the 27 books. Last week it was 39, a little less this week. The 27 books with 27 promises, 27 reasons for giving thanks to our faithful God. Now, I know you know, and I'm sure you're aware, there are many more promises in the Bible. We're just dealing with a promise from each book of the Bible, but there's many more. And how many, I mean, remember when you was a child, you used to sing a song about the promises being all the promises of God being yours. What, that, Becky, what was that song? It's mine. Yeah. Every verse, every line, right? We sang that as kids. We made something to start singing that again. And a little commercial, if you let me break in here. Break in with a commercial. Uh, Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, Miss Terry, we're gonna we're gonna finish the two hundredth part important events of the Bible. We've been working three almost four years on this, going through. The 200 most important events in the Bible. And on December the 1st, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, on Zoom and down in the basement in the disclosed location, we're going to be finishing the 200th greatest event of the Bible. If you've gone through that, you have gotten quite a good education. We have written out commentary on a yellow pad for the whole Bible. And Barbara has typed and then given out notes and there's been a lot of work gone into that. 
But we will celebrate uh, Wednesday night on December the 1st, finishing a long study. And I think everybody has told me that they know more about the Bible than they've ever known in their life, just going book by book, going through events of the Bible, chapter by chapter. It's been a great and a very interesting work and experience, and I think Barb says she needs a rest from some of that. 27 books, 27 promises, 27 reasons for giving thanks to our God. God promises to give rest to those who are weary and burdened, those who come to Him. How many are glad that's a good promise? He promises to give rest. It's called the great invitation. It's called the great promise of rest, which can only be found in Jesus Christ and the cross. Come on, say amen. If you, if you, when you come to the cross, that's where you found rest. Otherwise, you were restless. But when you came to the cross, you found rest because of Christ and what he did on the cross. Come, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, burdened. It's called the greatest invitation. And some people that study the scriptures and scholars have said that in the Bible, 66 books, there are 1,900 invitations that God gives to us. Now, next Sunday, we'll be speaking on 1,900 invitations. No, no. I'd love to, but that might be a little bit much. You might have to wear your jammies and just bring a lunch. And... But aren't you glad that God promises to give us rest? And there is no rest for those who have not been to the cross. And we can put our heads on the pillow at night those of us who have been to the cross and whether we know whether we wake up in this world or the, the other world we know we're with Christ and man that is, a, that, is, that is great security and that gives us great rest doesn't it God promises in the book of Mark promises a reward to those who give a cup of water to the thirsty in the Jesus name. It's speaking of taking the gospel to others. And when we take the gospel to others, we will be rewarded for that. And Jesus also said, and if we give a cup of water in his name it's the same, to someone, a stranger, it's the same as giving it to him. If we feed someone, if we visit someone in prison, it's the same as visiting him as well in other scripture verses. God promises in Luke eleven thirteen to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. He says, if you being parents or being a father, give, being evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Man, this speaks of the goodness of God. God is good. And, you know, Brother Ed leads us into that all the time. Brother Ed says, God is good. And he waits for us. You don't have to wait too long, do you, Ed? And we say all the time, God is good all the time. The goodness of God. In John chapter 14, 27, God promises to give us peace like the world does not know. I tell you, the world can't give it to you, and the world can't take it away. God gives us a peace the world does not know. It speaks of the peace of God. Believers have peace with God, and believers can walk in the peace of God. If you, if you know God, K-N-O-W, you know no peace in O God in O peace and let me give you a little thought here the peace of God believers have the peace with God but you can also walk with the peace of God and the peace with God would be related to John, you know, 316. Whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That gives us peace with God. But you can live your life with the peace of God as well. Amen. 
in the book of Acts that God promises to equip us as his witnesses to the world. Miracle working power as the Holy Spirit comes upon us. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. My father, a great preacher, much greater than I feel like I ever have been, but he would always quote this verse that you'll be a witness in Judea. You'll be a witness in Jerusalem because everybody wants to go to Jerusalem, but you'll go to Samaria too. And the Jews did not want to go to Samaria because of racial situation. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it is a miracle working witness. It is a miracle working power. In fact, if you, if you read in the Amplified Bible, and when the Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power, ability, and might. Does that sound good? Yes. I mean, believe in that promise. Yes. God, in the book of Romans, God promises to work all things for the good of those who love him. And we know, and if you don't know, you need to know. And we know that he makes all things work together for our good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I love Romans 8, 28. One of the great scriptures of the Bible. God promises in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You'll know that your labor is not in vain. It's never in vain if you do it for the Lord. Come on. It's true. Go to 2 Corinthians 1 4. God promises us, our, gives us comfort in our troubles, comfort in tribulation. And there is tribulation. He doesn't say there's no tribulation. He just says he's going to give you comfort in your troubles and tribulation. Amen. In Galatians 1, 4, going through the New Testament, God promises to rescue us from this present evil age. Some translations say deliver. He delivers us from this present evil world. One rendition of it says... And boy, that really means a lot. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. That's very important in this day and time. Because evil has been loosed. And it's, it's out there in such great dimension now. And we need to pray that prayer. Deliver us from evil. And God promises to comfort us. And he promises to rescue us from this present evil world. In uh, Ephesians 3.20, I love one of my favorite verses. God promises to do for us immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or think or imagine. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundant above all that you ask or think according to his power that works in you. Man, that's a promise, isn't it? I believe in that. And I live by that. I love Ephesians 3.20. In Philippians 1.6, God promises to encourage, to continue the good work He has begun in us. Philippians 1.6, He promises growth. He will support us. He will help us to grow until the rapture takes place. Some people feel like the rupture has already taken place. But he will help us make it through the hard times and the difficult places. Don't you believe that? In Colossians 3, 4, he promises to arrange for us to appear with Christ in his glory. He's made arrangements for us. And the only way we can do that, he's got to give you a better body than you got now. <laughs> And I'm, I'm telling you, I, now some of you looked in the mirror and thought your body was okay today. But it ain't good enough for this arrangement. you got to have a glorified body. And he promises that he's going to give us a glorified body that we may appear with Christ in his glory. Man, that'll get you, light your fire, won't it? Get you going. What about, what about, he says in 1 Thessalonians, 
He promises that he will do it because he is faithful. He who calls you is our, our scripture we bounced off of to start today. And in that, in that context, he will sanctify us wholly, spirit, soul, and body. And what he who has called you will do it. What will he do? He will sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. And notice spirit is first soul, and then body. We want to put body first, body's last, spirit, soul, and body in that order. Interesting context there. Okay, in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, God promises to give us peace at all times in every way. I love that. If you make a note on your notes, unending peace unending peace in the middle of trouble unending peace in the middle of trouble come on first timothy 615 jesus god promises to bring jesus back to earth in his own time first timothy 1 6 15 there is no doubt You'll not be wondering, is that Jesus? No, you're going to know who he is. You're going to know who the King of King and the Lord of Lord is. There won't be a, well, let's scratch my head. Who could that be? No, I don't think so. You're going to know he's the King of Kings, and you're going to know he's the Lord of Lords. And he promises, God promises to bring Jesus back to earth in his time. And we and every eye shall see him. Amen. Second Timothy 1.12 says God promises to guard what we have entrusted to him. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him, entrusted in him until the rapture, until I see him face to face. How many believe that that is true? He will guard what we have entrusted to him. And then God promises to help us say no. No, not all, to ungodliness and worldly passions. Titus chapter 12, 2, verse 12. By looking at the cross, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, following him, looking to the cross, will he make this promise come to pass for us? God promises in Philemon, verse 6, to make our partnership with others in the faith good and positive and effective. Our faith should be effectual. That's to use that word. Our faith should be effectual. The true fruit of the Spirit with grace should extend to others in the body of Christ, making good partnerships in the family of God. Just as Philemon was to Paul, good partnerships makes a difference. Friendships, partnerships through the fruit of the Spirit and through the grace that God extends. And the word effective or effectual is the key words there in that verse. Going to Hebrews, we're getting close to the end of the New Testament, closer and closer. God promises to produce in us what is pleasing to Him. Well, listen, you, you think it's up to you, right? Well, it's not totally up to you, because if it was totally up to us, we would all be in right pitiful shape, wouldn't we? How many knows God is working in us 24-7? That's what people don't understand outside there in the world. Well, I just couldn't live a Christian life. And I look straight in the eye and I'm saying, well, you're right. You can't. But when God begins to work in your life, when God begins to work in your life, he will produce in us what is pleasing to him by making you, he used the word perfect, but he's speaking of maturity, making you mature or perfect in every good work to do his will. That's what the Holy Spirit has been sent to do. I said that's what the Holy Spirit has been sent to do, to make us like Christ. So, you know, God wants us to be right, but he's the one that's making us right. And there is, there's a part of personal responsibility, of course. But unless he's making us right, we're never going to be right in our own strength. 
James chapter 1, 3 and 4. God promises to use, he promises to use difficulties to give us perseverance and maturity. He promises that. I, I think he promises the difficulties too. He promises to give, use difficulties to give us perseverance and maturity. It's called the trying of our faith. Testing develops perseverance. Testing develops persistence. And what he is telling us is you must not grow discouraged. You must not allow yourself to be discouraged because God takes the difficulties and he, by the trying of our faith, testing develops that perseverance and that persistence in our faith. We go to 1 Peter 5, 7. God promises to care for all the anxieties that we cast on Him. I know that some of you out there probably don't have any of those. I can just tell by your face, you, not, you just don't have anxieties at all. But I got a bunch of them. I want you to make a note. You don't have much room, but make a note. This is a good promise, but you got to do something. You got to cast them on Him. And you got to leave them there. Don't go cast them on Him and then take them back. You're an Indian giver. Excuse the word, because that's incorrect these days. Everything's incorrect these days. Everybody's offended by everything. Uh, listen, put down after 1 Peter 5, 7, once and for all, I commit my cares and cast them on him, our short version of it, once and for all, committed to God, all my cares. You got to cast them on him and forget it. Walk away. Don't pick it back up again. No. Nope. Once and for all, cast your anxieties upon the Lord, and you're going to be so much lighter. You'll feel like, man, have I lost all this weight? I feel so much better now. In 2 Peter 1, 3, God promises to provide for everything we need for a godly life. 2 Peter 1, 3, through the knowledge of Him, through the knowledge of Him, growing in the knowledge of God, it provides everything we need to live the life that God will be glorified in. In 1 John 1, 9, God promises to forgive all of our confessed sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. The sinner has to believe and the saint has to confess. You know, we got to learn how that works. Too bad that we don't feel free to confess our situations to God. You know, Bubba that goes down to the bar, he'll confess everything to the bartender. He, he just loves going down there to see his buddy, buddy Bill, Bill the bartender. He'll just sit there and confess it all to him and feel so much better when he walks out. Well, that don't do a, maybe somewhat good to get it off your chest. But one thing about the Lord, you get it off the chest and he throws it behind his back, never to be remembered against you again. And Satan tries to go fishing without a license, but he throws it behind his back, our sins. Does that, make, does that make sense to you? If we confess our sins, the sinner needs to believe, but the saint needs to confess. And believe as well. Let's go to 2 John verse 2. God promises to place his truth within us. 2 John 2, he says, that truth that he places within us cannot change. Jesus says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, right? 
God promises to bless us in body and soul, including financial blessings. 3 John verse 2. I pray God bless us, body, soul, and spirit. Financial blessings are included. We're not talking about a prosperity gospel. We're not into that. But we know that God blesses. How many feels like you've been blessed in spirit, soul, and body, and financial blessings? I mean, we're blessed. We're blessed. And that should give us reason for great gratitude to our God. And then we get down to Jude 24, verse 24. God promises to keep us from stumbling. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Don't you like that? Is that not a good promise? There's a lot of insecure Christians walking around, and they need to get secure. You know, the Baptist says you can't be lost, and some of the other groups think you can be saved and lost from one day to the next. That's wrong, too. And, you know, I'm telling you right now, there is a security in Christ. We're not saved and lost from one day to the next. God's not up in heaven with a big steel boot just hoping you'll mess up so he can kick you out of the kingdom. No, he went to too much trouble. He sent his son to die on the cross. He's not interested in booting you out. He wants to help you. He wants to keep you. He wants to make you blessed. He's paid too much for you. You. He's not wanting to get rid of you. He wants to draw you close to him. That's what he does. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Yes. And Jesus promises, yes, I'm coming soon. Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies, he who prophesies, talking about Jesus, surely he says, I will come quickly. Wow. I know sometimes we talk about the coming of the Lord and we are come sometimes wondering, well, when are you going to come? We think, we hear this, we hear that, we read these prophecies, we talk about these prophecies being fulfilled. But one of the promises Jesus gives us, yes, I am coming soon. Surely I come quickly. He who testifies of the prophecy these things says surely I come quickly. Amen. Talking about the faithfulness of God in closing God comforts us as a mother comforts. He pities as a father pities his children. He sympathizes as a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He protects us as a king. He heals us as a physician. He is devoted to us as a faithful spouse. Those concepts permeate the book of Hebrews, written to the Jewish Christians who were facing uncertain times. Do we have something in common with those Jewish Christians who were facing uncertain times? Yes. Some of these seasoned believers felt like giving up. Have you ever felt like giving up lately? Dave Wilkerson wrote a book with that title years ago. Great book. Have you ever felt like giving up lately? When you can still get it on Amazon, I'm sure. In chapter 10, they had direct... Uh, in chapter 10, the writer uses one of the greatest pictures of prayer. I love this, and I know you do too. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, the greatest picture of prayer in the Bible by reminding us that they had direct, immediate access into the holy place, into the very presence of God through the blood of Christ. Our great high priest, Hebrews 10, therefore he said, we must hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful can you say amen, amen. <laughs> man you can just get beside yourself up here when you're preaching and sometimes I feel like I am sitting standing beside myself <laughs> 
whatever you are facing today, remember, whatever you are facing today or any day, you have instant, immediate, perpetual access to God's presence through the great high priest, through the God's holiness, through his goodness, through his truth, through his power. They are faithfully transmitted to us by the virtue of his promises. Man, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Remember, you have instant, immediate, perpetual access into God's presence at any moment, at any time, anywhere. Through the great high priest, God's, to God's holiness, to God's goodness, to God's truth, to God's power. And they are faithfully transmitted to us by the virtue of his promises. And then finish up another quote by Joseph Rainsford said in the 1800s now, God's promises are a staff for our hand of faith to grasp. I love that. And I hope everyone, as Joan and I did with our family, had a great Thanksgiving. And we are looking forward to celebrating the reason for the season. And, and we have to remind ourselves with all the craziness of what's going on, it is Jesus that is the reason for it all. I know that Joe and Barb and, and Tony and, and Rose and some of us that were together on our tour of Israel, ever since going to Israel, it's made uh, Christmas uh, a lot more, more, a lot more interesting, a lot more special to me. Uh, we went to the shepherd's field, and when we were going through the gate of the shepherd's field there, a, a, a young Arab boy, probably 12 years old, came walking by the gate going into the shepherd's field, and he had a little lamb in his arms. And... Uh, Everybody wanted to talk to him, you know, and maybe it was a way to get attention. Maybe it was a way to maybe get a few coins. I don't know what all his purpose was, but a little 12-year-old air boy and he had that little lamb in his arms. And that was a moment in time to witness that little lamb. And I think about looking across the shepherd's field Jesus the Messiah, glory to God in the highest. He came to gather up the sheep. I'm mean, glad you're one of those little sheep that he gathered up. And I want you to know that you're in the arms of the Savior. And he has promised all these great promises to keep us to keep us from falling, to keep us in the midst of trouble, to keep us during tribulation times. He's promised to carry us all the way until we see him face to face. Let's stand together if we could.